Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're coming from today. Welcome to the Web3 Warriors podcast, episode six, featuring Violetta Melnikova, um, an amazing artist joining us from Europe today. Looking forward to talking about her journey into Web3 and uh, the cool projects that she's got going on. I uh, just want to welcome everybody to Web3 Warriors and do a quick introduction before we start off our interview today. Um, I also want to just take a quick moment to uh, acknowledge Ukraine and the war happening. Um, quick moment of silence and just acknowledging, you know, that it is 2022 and we hope that we can, uh, you know, work things out through dialogue and diplomacy um, and without invading anybody. Um, and we pray for, you know, quick conclusion and uh, peace in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, war is never good and we hate to see it. So I just wanted to add that quickly out the out the gate. Um, but yes, welcome to Web3 Warriors podcast. We are focused on really highlighting and emphasizing the real potential here in the Web3 space um, and really showing people what the blockchain technology and specifically the NFT community and the NFT market or industry, if you want to look at it that way, is really offering um, creatives in this space. Um, and I think Violetta is an amazing example of someone who has a long resume and history in traditional art. And she's taken that amazing expertise uh, into the Web3 space and has a lot of really um, exciting uh, projects on the go. Um, and one of the th topics that you will hear a lot about in Web3 and specifically in the NFT space, um, more so outside of the, the metaverse conversation, although they can be connected, um, are what are called generative NFTs. Um, and so with that, you know, you see a lot of people with their different uh, profile pictures, um, with different types of images. And a lot of the times those PFP uh, NFT images are part of a, a big collection, um, usually generative NFT collections. And so what's meant by the word generative, um, and it's a bit of a misnomer, because when I first came into the space, I definitely thought of generative art as just kind of being something a computer spit out. <laughs> and I didn't really think about like the creative process that that was required to create generative projects. Um, I thought of it like, oh, so the computer's just spitting out 10,000 images, and now you know, you're saying they have value. But the way that they work is um, basically, if anyone who's familiar with Photoshop and the way that layers work, and you can have you know, different layers attached to, the, to make the whole image, right? So for example, you can start with just the face and maybe you know, you've know you got a layer that has a certain type of goatee and you got another layer that has a different type of facial hair, et cetera, right? So you can change that. And so what the generative projects do is they actually take all those different layers um, and the computer automatically kind of generates them based on a set of parameters and rules that are laid out um, and, and makes that part of it generative. So the different layers that are being all combined together are where the kind of computer and the generative aspect comes in. But all of those layers have to be created. <laughs> and that's where the art comes in, right? And that's where I think a lot of people miss that side of the equation where it's like it takes in the best case scenario, you know, a lot of painstaking detail and attention to detail to make sure that all those layers are lining up nicely when the generative, you know, um, computer is, is putting them together. They, you know, you'll find a lot of different projects where maybe it's hard too because a lot of these projects have 5,000, 10,000 and so many different variables that some of them, you know, they'll go through it and they'll mint it and you'll find all kinds of random mistakes in there, um, you know, where certain hair, you know, facial hair is <laughs> over top of another item or something like that. So just important to think about all of the nuance that goes into a generative project. And it is a lot of creative work, not just with the actual artist who draws each layer and creates each piece, but the programmer and uh, the developer who has to make sure that it executes properly and that everything looks good at the end. So that's the, the big educational piece that I wanted to come with today on uh, Web3 Warriors before we really dive into the conversation with Violetta here, who can probably share a lot more on this subject than I can, as I know she's been very busy with a, a very cool generative project that I will let her uh, describe to us. Uh, but yeah, I just want to explain that. So that's what a generative NFT project is. Um, they're usually thousands of pieces, maybe, you know, 1500 up to 4,000 or 5,000. Some of them are 10, 12,000. I think of the Afro droids with uh, Owo. He went up to 12,000 and somehow sold those out in like a day or something. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, it takes a lot of work for all the different um, 
generative projects. And I think it's just important to look at them through that lens because um, I think a lot of people coming, especially from the traditional art space, and I was a bit of an art collector before NFTs. Um, and I definitely came into NFTs wanting to just like support artists and loving that side of it, knowing that I can like, for example, Violetta was one of the first <laughs> uh, pieces that I bought actually. And just knowing that when I buy that piece of art, it's going directly to the artist and supporting them, you know? And so that's what drew me to NFTs. And so initially I kind of had this weird resistance to generative NFT projects. And it was really at a time when I probably should have been the most open to them because it was so lucrative. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was my own background. And so I'm hoping that with this um, podcast, maybe I can help others avoid that kind of misunderstanding and realize that there is a lot of creativity and artistry that goes into uh, generative NFT projects. Um, you know, so Violetta is involved with the Enchanted Valley NFTs, which I believe is minting in about eight or nine days. Um, there's a few others that I really like, but I just want to give a quick plug to a couple. Um, there's the Ancient Warriors Empire uh, generative projects that's come out um, in the last few weeks. And I really love what they're doing about taking, you know, South American and African kind of tribal styles. Um, and, and making that like education and, and telling that story about those tribes um, as part of their NFT project. Um, and another really cool one is um, the Genesis tapes. And uh, the Genesis tapes are really focused on telling the story of uh, Gable, who was a producer of Tupac Shakur's. And um, the amount of amazing history that I've been able to hear just sitting in on their project uh, meetings and conversations that they've had on Clubhouse um, is really just invaluable. Um, and they're an example of a generative project that's taken an artist, um, Scam, who's really done a lot of really cool hip hop art in the past. And this was his first, you know, generative NFT project. And he has shared all the crazy painstaking detail that's required to make it look nice. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to plug those two. I, I really think it's impressive, you know, the amount of work that goes into these projects and not all of them, you know, blow up right away. And I actually think some of the best projects are gonna take time to maybe sell out and, and build their community up. Um, so I think it's important to, to see that side of the generative NFT projects, because I do think that often when that topic comes up, it is all about, you know, going to the moon and chasing the hype and making that quick flip and, and making a lot of money. Um, but these projects are also connected to broader visions, you know, um, so they all have their own, you know, kind of, well, not all, but the good ones <laughs> generally have a, a, a roadmap and a long term vision that's attached to selling these generative NFTs. So it's not just for the art, it's not just to support that project and the artist that created it, but actually it's usually to invest in a broader project that they have going on. Um, so it's a really cool concept and it's very uh, kind of key to the NFT space and it is creating a lot of energy and buzz um, and the projects that claim to be doing something and get people hooked in, but then disappear after everybody buys their NFTs, we call those rug pulls. <laughs> and uh, those are the ones you wanna watch out for. And that's why it's important to always do your own research and actually understand the, you know, the motives behind the art and the actual goal of the creators and what's happening. Um, don't just buy into anything because it looks amazing and is a really good sales pitch. Um, that's all the caution education I'll have for today. <laughs> I could talk on that subject probably for a long time, but I don't want to waste Violetta's time and she can share a bit more information on that as well. Um, so I just want to say generative projects are really cool and I look forward to this talk, talk with you, uh, Violetta. And Thanks for joining us. So without further ado, I am really looking forward to uh, hearing about your journey. Uh, I know you do have an artist background, Violetta. Um, so thanks for joining us. Please, can you share just a bit of where you're coming from, your artist background, and then what's brought you to uh, Web3 before we dive into your projects here? And thanks for joining us again. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's a huge pleasure. Uh, I'm not very used to the video format of, uh, of interviews. Uh, so that's also very exciting. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Violetta. Right now I'm located in Italy. Uh, I moved here a couple years ago from a tiny country in the Baltics called Lithuania. And uh, yeah, my journey uh, in the NFT started exactly one year ago. I think I'm gonna celebrate next week one year um, since I got my MetaMask and I got my first cryptocurrency and all of that. <laughs> I was never involved into anything crypto related before I heard about NFTs. And I came into this world purely from the uh, artist's interest, uh, looking for 
you know, another venue to just show my art to the world, possibility to make my living, new possibility to make my living as an artist. Um, as it was mentioned, I do come from a fine art background. Uh, I studied fine arts uh, after school uh, in art academy back home. And I used to go to the art school as a kid. And uh, after I uh, finished my studies, I started working as a tattoo artist. And that was one of the main professions that was generating uh, some, uh, you know, like financial stability in my life uh, in a creative way. Uh, I spent 15 years working in different tattoo studios around the world, uh, living like a digital nomad, backpacker's life as well. And uh, during that time, I had uh, different periods when I would get involved into different um, new artistic forms. Uh, I really like to discover uh, new mediums, uh, new genres. So I had a time when I became a doll maker. Uh, I used to make uh, collectible porcelain ball jointed dolls. Um, it's a pretty interesting uh, technique <laughs> that I had to teach myself. Um, basically just like, you know, internet, YouTube, Googling. So I had like my ceramic studio, uh, porcelain kiln, uh, and it was a very, very uh, hang difficult handcraft type of handcraft uh, that requires a lot, a lot of patience. Wow. And then I had like, some experience of working uh, with the clothing and a fashion industry, like producing some uh, mostly one on one, uh, very elaborate type of clothing with a lot of beadwork, complicated embroidery and stuff like that. Wow. And then, uh, I discovered NFTs when I moved here in Italy. And the story went like that I moved here exactly on the first first day of the first lockdown when the pandemic hit and the first year uh, we were almost in instant lockdowns and uh, obviously tattoo artists were one of those professions that were extremely hit by all of the global situation with the pandemic. Uh, I wasn't able to work for one year and uh, suddenly I had a lot of time to learn something new and to deepen my uh, digital tools as well. I was always a digital kid. I got my first computer very early. I was always familiar with Photoshop. I got my first iPad Pro in 2015 as soon as it came out and I feel very like native with Procreate, uh, which is my favorite drawing application. So I had one year to uh, just do that every day because there was completely nothing else to do had nowhere to go <laughs> there was no social life i moved to the new country uh, i didn't know the language i didn't know anybody so i was just drawing and like uh, putting in uh, on my hard drive all of this work that i had no idea what i even gonna do with it and once i just saw an article about nfts and uh, i read about people and all of that Mm. And I started Googling and searching, and that's basically how my journey started. I had nobody who could teach me or tell me anything about that. So I had to teach myself all of all of that things. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I love how you say that's just another avenue. And I think that's the important way for people to look at it. And, you know, people hear NFTs and they just think about a lot of the narrative and like, oh, NFTs are a scam or you're saving JPEGs. It's like, why don't you think about the fact that like when you buy an NFT, you're supporting that artist directly, you know? Um, and I love how you're saying, so you had a lot of these pieces on Procreate already. And you, so once you kind of realize the potential with NFTs, um, I'm thinking somebody on has said in the past uh, in many of the NFT rooms I'm in, like if you're sitting on art, <laughs> NFTs are so perfect for you, right? It's like if you're sitting, even just a project, even if it's poetry, you know, whatever, something you kind of stashed away in the closet and you thought you're never going to find a, a, a platform for it. It's like NFTs are tailor made for that, right? Totally. And uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned, you know, like the left click saving issues and all of that because as being one of the artists who was trying to monetize my art in some way uh, struggling with algorithms social media trying to find some commissions you know like uh, it was always an issue and it was always so difficult to make this decision to put my work in high resolution in the internet for everybody to just save it and what i discovered when i started to understand what nfts actually are that it's not an issue anymore because it's about digital ownership and suddenly i'm completely fine with people right clicking <laughs> saving my stuff because like it, in a way it created a completely new possibility for me to provide uh, free content for people to look at my art, 
and be completely fine with that and you know like you're very welcome to save it because mm -hmm. like it's not the ownership has been stabilized exactly and, and when you look at it that way it's almost like just free promotion for you right because the people who actually want to own it and want to support you will be like hey where'd you find that <laughs> and so then maybe they'll come and buy your nft so yeah that's a very important point i love it um and so you're saying you got that background doll maker you've got fashion design in your background that's that's quite a uh, wide range of uh, creative ventures that you've been on and i know one of your collections as well i think you had you were working in dolls right uh, maybe you could just tell us briefly um or maybe it doesn't have to be briefly <laughs> uh what are the different collections you have on OpenSea, and, and maybe just take us through i think you have three different ones two or three uh, maybe just uh, give us a bit of that. So the eye above, above sky is what is what hooked me in. When you, your eye above sky art and the literature and everything you had attached to it is really amazing. Um, but yeah, maybe just give us a quick breakdown of your main collections on OpenSea right now. Yes, yeah, sure. I have three collections on OpenSea. I'm also minting on other platforms such as Known Origin and Foundation. But right. when it comes to OpenSea, I do have three collections there. And the one you mentioned was my very first one. Uh, that was literally that collection that opened the gates of uh, entering the whole NFT community and NFT world for me. And this is where my first collectors came from. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very important personally uh, collection for me because exactly there I was able to techniques that I could never find time to deep dive before, which is frame by frame animation. Um, it's a process that requires a lot of time. It's a lot of like labor creating all of these frames to make one harmonic uh, looking uh, loop animated loop and obviously in my life as tattoo artist before i wouldn't have time for that because i mean it wouldn't generate any income for me and i was so happy you know that finally i could have possibility to do this type of things that were impossible to monetize in a real physical art world before nfts so that i did a complete deep dive in that collection uh, back then i was dropping one piece every week i was dropping one every thursday and there are also additional pieces in that collection. Also, I was just starting. I didn't know many, many things, you know, how to organize my stuff, how to promote my stuff. I'm not very insertive when it comes to like going around Twitter spaces and like Clubhouse's room and pitching mm -hmm. myself. So that collection was just like really my visual way to um, tell the world that, hey, here I am, I exist. I was by making drops as much as possible because that would gen what would generate that first attention for my work. Sure. And then the second collection I have on OpenSea, which is called Matryoshka. This is my tribute to my uh, heritage as uh, uh, somebody who was born in a family of Russian immigrants. And, you know, like uh, the nesting doll, Russian doll Matryoshka is something that uh, people all around the world are familiar with. <laughs> and they, sure. uh, Something that um, makes people have this like nice warm feeling. Uh, it's a toy that I really used to love in the childhood, and I really love the deep uh, symbolism and meaning behind the nesting doll. Um, that symbol of like opening your essence up, uh, you know, again and again, and you arrive to the tiniest one, uh, the tiniest doll inside all of that seven dolls, which is uh, called the seed in uh, traditional interpretation. Okay. which would be the essence of our spirit. And it was my first attempt to understand what it means to launch a collectible project. It's hand-drawn, one-on-one pieces. But it was my first collection uh, that was made, you know, like in, I was dropping uh, for, uh, from 20 to 50 pieces uh, per one drop. And uh, it's dedicated only to that topic. And another collection that I have on OpenSea is called Lycanthropia. And uh, it's a collection about, uh, that is already my main technique, uh, my main study probably as somebody who comes from a painting background to convert it into digital medium. Mm. And this is where you can see the most of me as artist, probably what I would do when I work with oil on canvas as well. Those are like surreal dystopian kind of portraits. Uh, mostly I'm focused on uh, drawing different uh, female characters. Uh, I often say about myself that I'm an artist that really likes to dig into archetypes, uh, mm -hmm. meaning I'm looking for symbols that are easy to recognize, to be recognized no matter where you come from uh, on this planet. Something that everybody with us can touch, you know, when we look at that, it's like the plants, our relation with spirits of different animals, our relation with nature around us. 
in this collection, I have put myself uh, to a challenge to create a complicated uh, digital piece of uh, artwork, uh, digital paintings, I call them, but in a square format, in a format that fits well as a profile picture. And that was something I want to deep dive and understand how it works composition wise, uh, because square is a very unusual format for a traditional painter. Uh, and it was the most difficult uh, format for me when I used to work with real media before going digital. So I looked at creating this uh, collection as a very high end kind of profile picture work, if it makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. And it's beautiful. Um, just so it is still on Procreate though, right? And yes, like, everything I do is made with Procreate. Yes. Amazing. But the way that that light, it just shimmers. Um, I'm looking at the guy with the, the crystal or the girl with the crystals on her head. <laughs> and uh, it's just really <laughs> impressive light work. The way you've made that shimmer, it looks like it should be animated or something. <laughs> um, oh, thank but yeah, no, it's really impressive. I definitely wish you the best with that. Um, I did want to ask you on the on the uh, collections when it comes to your initial eye above sky collection um, and i don't know how much you've kind of duplicated this with your other collections um but the um the stories with each one right and so you talked about them being kind of like daily oracles and uh good luck charms um and i have to say that's what really kind of hooked me in um as a libra like there was the justice one i really liked i think there was another one that first hooked me in i know i definitely got this one though because i needed the libra scales and <laughs> um but yeah when you look at like so you got the 12th card and all the different cards kind of have their own um i don't know it's almost like a tarot kind of uh tarot-esque reading but you know it's without kind of the astrology angle on it so what inspired you to do that and you were really one of the first i saw that like had descriptions that were kind of philosophical and like seem to be attempting to hook people in with the language um so what inspired that and uh just yeah just anything you can share about you know the literature attached to your pieces sure well um the only collection that doesn't have that type of descriptions is lycanthropia that's the only one that i just really wanted people to relate uh, on a purely um color composition uh, emotional you know like response to that way mm. uh but it's very nice that you have mentioned tar tarot cards and that uh, there was this looking at that uh, like I, I'm really interested in uh, reading tarot and studying all the tradition of tarot cards since I was a teenager mm. and uh, I just wanted to create something that um, you know like there are tarot cards and there are what are called oracle cards there are so many different systems of uh, reading cards and I always wanted to create my own and I even uh, started doing some sketches many, many years ago. I've been trying to sketch out uh, different cards, but in a physical world, it's a very big challenge. Uh, I even had idea of drawing my own tarot card, like over 70 cards that you have to draw by, can, uh, by hand, you know, release it in a physical world, uh, print it, distribute it, and I, I could never find um, nor economical resources for that, nor time. And as soon as I heard about NFTs, that was my first idea. I was like, wow, like this is perfect. Now I have possibility to uh, release this uh, type of cards with the messages that I find important attached to that images. And I don't have to struggle with like uh, going away, I don't know, for a few years <laughs> until I prepare all of the 70 or like whatever of those uh, yeah. with oracle card systems uh, it can be any number so uh, that's why i called them sometimes moon oracle cards because i'm um, they are related more to the moon uh, moon cycles and yeah the messages that come from are just the messages that i gather during my travels around the world i'm a very passionate traveler and I used to spend a lot of time in really remote corners of the world. And there was a period in my life when I went on a deep uh, spiritual search, um, very interested in anthropology, in uh, folk tales, legends, and all of the texts that I write for my works in this and on other collections and for my one-on-one -on -one pieces are based on that, based on, uh, based awesome. on uh, the years of traveling. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so with that in mind, then maybe you have a thought on the kind of international vibes of the NFT space. And have you have you found, you know, maybe as a worldly person, since you've traveled to cool corners of the earth, 
I want to one day, but oh, I haven't. Yes. <laughs> but what do you feel about, uh, yeah, the NFT space? That's something that's definitely attracted me as well, as um, I like to consider myself a multiculturalist, and I think there's a lot to learn from different cultures. Uh, so what do you think about that in the space? And uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, like, uh, obviously, I think that this is like absolutely fascinating for a possibility for people to, um, for artists to tell the world about themselves and no matter when they are on the um, on this planet. Of course, it does have its uh, challenges uh, with entry points such as like English language, pretty much of a challenge. So I'm trying to help a lot of people also that come, you know, like friends from countries where speaking English well is not very common. Uh, my, uh, there are friends all over the world that I've been onboarding to NFTs and trying to help them with translation and everything. And I have to say in the beginning, it was pretty difficult if somebody wasn't fluent in English because you have to go around and like just talk and pitch your work so right. much. But now it's definitely becoming much easier because the NFTs are spreading all around the world with the speed of light. And now there is an NFT community in any language. <laughs> so people are definitely like, getting awesome. more and more opportunities right at the moment, no matter where they are. Yeah. Yeah, because I've been seeing more and more different foreign languages uh, popping up on even on Clubhouse. But I see NFTs like, oh, I know that, but I don't know any of the other languages. They're saying. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's definitely good. And I, I hope that that continues to grow in that way. But uh, uh, kudos to you for helping people on board um, and, and seeing that gap and trying to uh, address it. So that's really cool. Um, and on your point about the tarot cards, the other advantage of being able to take that whole project that you had dreamt about before and put it on the blockchain is now you can animate them right and you make them even more kind of uh, gamified or engaging in, in a lot of ways right right yeah these animations uh well i was just trying like because most of them have uh, some kind of looping mandala uh, on the top uh, some universal symbols that are moving and shifting sometimes it's just sun and moon uh, sometimes it's the landscape changing mm -hmm. uh, my most of my work are very much about cyclicity of life so you will see a lot of uh, night to day sky changes and things like that and it was uh, just another extra tool that I was so happy to use to deepen that message <laughs> most definitely I love it well, very cool and definitely wish you continued success on all these collections. They're really amazing, amazing works of art. I recommend everybody to check out Eye Above Sky and uh, Violeta Melnikova on OpenSea. Um, so switching from your amazing one of ones and limited edition collections um, you've got here and going to the topic of generative NFT projects. I know that you are um, fairly busy with a generative NFT project that you're collaborating with a, a team on. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, and any additional um, kind of insights on generative NFTs that I might have missed in my opening spiel there. <laughs> share, uh, share what you're working on and what you think about the generative NFTs. Sure. Well, I started, uh, I joined the team uh, of Enchanted Valley uh, six months ago. I was the fourth people to join the team, which is now 20 people strong already. And uh, the first few months, it was mostly uh, the co-founders, uh, our brand designer and myself, uh, figuring the basics out, you know, just standing where we want to go stylistically wise what is our main like our direction is going to be both for brand and for the avatars itself and it's very my experience with profile pictures in the beginning was very similar to what you were telling you know like in the very beginning of our uh, talk um because i came to this space as an artist uh, and i really wanted to sell my one-on-one -on -one work and when the first pfp projects dropped i didn't figure out in the beginning i couldn't figure out in the beginning uh what is the utility behind uh, the whole concept of the profile picture collections that come in like such a big numbers and uh when everybody their focus and attention towards collecting pfp projects as an artist i felt like upset for some moment um you know i thought like oh it's uh, just like as you mentioned oh it's just computers beating out all of these managers uh, uh, images and you don't have to push put so much effort behind that but then time was going and i you know was studying the subject just like everybody and i started to understand uh the value behind these projects and so when um 
Charmaine, who is the visionary behind the um, Enchanted Valley uh, Enchanted Valley project, contacted me and uh, told me her vision and her ideas, what kind of value she wants to bring to uh, the NFT community through this project. I had absolutely like no doubt that I just want to jump on board and also because it's about fantasy and it's about rich lore and naturally type of artwork resonates with my own vision as an artist as well. So it's, um, it's pretty much of a challenge. I want to say that to everybody who thinks that a generator is a shortcut in any way to just create a lot of images. I would say that from my own experience, it's not really as easy as it seems like. It took me a long time to figure out how to transform my approach to the workflow in general to be able to generate that specific art style that we want to have because the, the examples of our avatars. It's not very typical um, NFT kind of generative collection. It's not flat, it doesn't have this bold outline and simple field colors. We really wanted to do something that is very art driven, something that is generated but still uh, looks and feels like a one on one art. So in result, we ended up with a collection that is going to have a record-breaking number of trades. Uh, you're expecting the total of, of more or less one and a half thousand trades, when a traditional uh, 10k generative art pieces uh, will often come like 300, like up to 600 trades. Wow! And that also came with its own challenges. Um, because generator is not just something that stacks layers so that you prepare and speeds it out. Uh, you have to go through the whole process of finding what is called the conflict. Uh, let's say uh, some ears don't work with some particular hair and uh, some particular makeup has to use, be used with some particular, uh, I don't know, like a uh, tone of skin and all of that. And all of that has to be pre-programmed and captured. And when there are so many traits uh, as we have, uh, it becomes almost mathematically impossible for generator to <laughs> all of the variety of right. what we have so we have to deal with a lot of so <laughs> developing our own technique yeah so does that mean that because it is so like next to impossible you have to essentially mint so you're doing groups of 2200 right so you have to almost generate them all and then review them before you let them go for public mint right that's kind of how it works so that you make sure that yeah, exactly. none of your randomly exactly generated pieces look faulty that's exactly how we are doing that because our collection is to five orders, uh, which are like five creatures uh, that belong to different five elements. And uh, so in a way, it's like five collections within one collection. Because every of these like orders that is going to come on a, uh, on a blockchain comes with its completely unique uh, set of traits. So they are not overlapping between the orders. So we do approach a generator in a very minimal way. Uh, what I learned to do is just using Generator in a way as an art tool. So uh, after all my layers, that particular order I d uh, are done, it's not enough to just generate and be happy with collection. So first we generate and we review the art because we want to make sure that everything looks consistent when you look at the collection overall. And if something is missing, if it doesn't feel that there is enough variety and diversity, I will add more traits, change some traits, then generate again. And again, because like if you take 2,200 pieces that's going to come in the first drop, first of five drops, there are 300 traits per that drop. And that's a lot for such small collection. And right. some of those come with a lot of conflicts. So generator can't pick those up. And then we have to generate small batches and review everything manually. So 100% manually curated collection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's really interesting to think about that because I, I think there are definitely projects that take the shortcut, right? And they, like you say, just have a way smaller amount of traits and maybe they don't review what the generator spits out. They just kind of hope for the best. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting the way you're going about that. Um, it sounds very time consuming though. Like, do you think that's practical on a, on a, on a long-term <laughs> basis <laughs> like is that something you can oh, always do for <laughs> it's a really good question you know like sometimes when we would go through like more and more batch generations to make sure that we have all the diversity and variety captured uh sometimes they would look at my like photoshop file open and i was like wow i could 
definitely save all of that manually as well. <laughs> but there is this magic of also generator uh, surprising us anyway, no matter how I try to pre-program all of the conflicts and all of that. Anyway, every time uh, we run the results, uh, it's like an art form in itself. And sometimes there are characters that come out that I had no idea <laughs> I did something like that. And it's something I deeply, deeply appreciate, you know, from, from this tool. I would call a generator and a new art tool. And I think it's something that's... Uh, I really hope it's something that is going to be acknowledged in the nearest future as a new art form in itself, instead of just uh, being considered a shortcut for making a yeah. bulk image. Yeah, I think we're on the way there, really. I mean, I like everything you just described. Like, clearly, that's a creative um, venture and a, and a real artistic endeavor. Um, but what I find interesting is the way that it marries the the actual like traditional artist or the creator and the developer or programmer. Like, can you speak a bit to that? Like, what is that? What's that relationship like for you on this team? And, and how do you think? You know. How, what, do you, what, what would you be your advice, I guess, to anybody out there maybe thinking about doing a generative project and not fully maybe appreciating the developer side of it? You know, what do you what do you say to that? Oh, wow. It really depends on how difficult you want to go when it comes to the artwork. Uh, in our case, uh, we knew we we're going to have a lot of challenges because of the style and the diversity of the artwork we wanted to come with. So we are really lucky with our tech team. Our tech team is based here in Italy as well. And uh, we were very lucky with them that they would patiently dedicate time to understand the challenge we are trying to resolve and go through many different test runs uh, to understand what kind of formula we will use for generator and using that solution uh, of generating different small batches, going with me through the endless spreadsheets, doing test generations, uh, and not everybody will go for that type of difficult approach that we decided to have. So my advice is first, uh, be clear how difficult uh, you want to go uh, with everything that uh, comes quantity of layers, um, the type of the artwork, because some generators uh, can even uh, have, um, in a way you can say that, that they can have Photoshop inside and can work even with masks and filters generator if you want to go for photographic let's say kind of projects mm -hmm. and need complicated transparencies and overlays so decide all of that in the beginning and something simple, something more that looks like flash art uh, probably you can get away with basic generators that doesn't require that much of a difficult tech approach some of those are already available online uh, even people without knowledge of code are starting to have access to those. But if you want to do go our way, then make sure you have a team have good time working with because you're going to spend so much. Together. Right. So the key, I think, is having a patient developer, <laughs> a exactly. developer who's willing to, who's not in a rush and is not looking for the, the quick bag, right? Right. That's exactly that. Patience is the key with type of projects. Yeah, it's interesting. And so when you speak on those other generators um, and kind of other, you could say no code options, maybe, um, have you actually looked at those? And, and do you think that in general, they just don't put out as good of quality? And is, you know, is that something you would well, recommend it really against? On the type of the artwork. It really depends on the type of the artwork. Something that we are doing, this kind of generator wouldn't be capable to work with because of the quantity of traits and also because of uh, Type of the layers that we have, uh, we have a lot of transparency, transparent layers so that are just like very, very slight shadows and some painterly effects. But it really depends on the style. If it's something more illustrative, something that consists of like simple line and color, uh, you can have a very nice result with that artwork as well, uh, with that type of generator. You know? And that's not a bad thing. What is important to keep in mind for somebody who decides to go that way, that generating a collection is like maybe one quarter of the whole labor that has to go there. After all of that, you have to deal with everything what comes with metadata, product, um, everything that comes with a smart contract, deploying smart contract, having a web page for that, testing all of the minting, you know, and that's like where where the help will be needed that's not a that's not a job for one person yeah, <laughs> yeah i think that's a key lesson because it's basically you need a team right and you need a reliable team yeah. where everyone's kind of on the same page right um that's totally. invaluable. Also because of the... oh sorry no no sorry go ahead 
uh, also because of the community building part of the profile picture projects because this type of projects the art is very important but community behind it is never less and sometimes even more important and to build a community you really need a strong team it's just physically impossible to split yourself <laughs> you know for all of this task. most definitely and i mean so maybe speak to a little bit of the um, enchanted valley so i mean your community seems to be growing nicely um and the vision is really excuse me cool and inspiring um maybe speak to a little bit of what you guys are doing on the community building front and then maybe a bit on the on the roadmap and uh you know why it speaks to you on from your kind of fantasy and oracle background you know um just share a little bit more on that and what people can look forward to with this project sure well first of all i think that we are extremely lucky with the way our team came together. All of the people on the team are very passionate about Enchanted Valley and vision of what we are uh, building there. Uh, all the people on the team are very talented, uh, many artists, great artists, have an amazing writer who is working on a whole lore, uh, developing the whole backstory of the project that is mind-blowing. Of course, our co-founders, Himanshu and Charmaine, they're really amazing people that have been in the space for a really long time and they're well known for uh, being great community builders. And that's how I met them in a space. They were one of those people that would hold rooms for people like me who are just coming into the NFT world and have a bunch of questions and are shy and maybe introverted. <laughs> a lot of support to people like myself. And then uh, all the project, the vision of Charmaine for this project from the very beginning was all about uh, being as inclusive as possible and all about the diversity and making people feel welcomed and giving everybody a possibility to find themselves in a collection and also welcomed in a community. Uh, that's what we are really trying to support that is not very big. But we are really trying to keep the vibe there as welcoming and as warm as possible, trying to create a safe place for people. That what was very important for me from the very, very beginning, you know, because if you want to work with a team for on a such a long term project and just like making it and selling it out, it's only the beginning of the journey when you start to grow a brand, because basically releasing a generative art collection is starting a brand you really want to make sure that you have same values the people on the team that you share same vision you know for future for years forward and that was one of my main motivation to team we have same values when it comes to uh giving uh, back to community helping artists and making people feel safe and inclusive in the space yeah, okay. and when talking about roadmap, uh, the roadmap is rich. <laughs> it <laughs> That's is, I yeah. don't know what to say about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, maybe just on the um, metaverse specifically, since um, something I didn't say in my intro spiel that I usually allude to um, is really I, I come to this space from the, the gaming perspective. Um, it's also why we live stream this podcast on Twitch. So I'm really hoping to maybe pull some gamers in and anybody can catch us uh, every Saturday, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's always nice to see the visuals um, along with everything you're talking about. I'm sharing the uh, Enchanted Valley NFTs right now. Um, and with the metaverse angle, I mean, that was part of what really pulled me in. Obviously, it's your first generative project. And honestly, I just wanted to be part of that, too. Um, but I really like what you guys are planning to do in the metaverse. And it looks like there's a pretty ambitious kind of build, um, slow build, maybe, but eventual kind of grand uh, plan for the metaverse. Do you want to just uh, share a little bit about that and, and what you guys plan to do as far as creating that welcoming space you're talking about and that safe space uh, in the metaverse? Well, already start we already kicked off uh even um the, that part of the project even before we started working on art itself uh we do have already uh, a land in metaverse gallery uh which is called an art bazaar in crypto voxels uh and this is something that we will be activating with our first metaverse event already next week because we just closed um the first derivative contest uh, for our community where people were drawing their own versions of our avatars right. and uh, we're going to open that gallery with a of artists and that space will be mostly for that type of visions uh, one of the big visions of enchanted valley is supporting um artists in the space especially artists that come from the places 
where it's more difficult, you know, like to get exposure, uh, supporting female artists, uh, supporting LGBTQ and BIPOC artists. That is a very big uh, point on the roadmap uh, for Enchanted Valley and where this voxel gallery comes at place. If like somebody scrolling through the links, make sure to it's a very beautiful build. Uh, you can feel straight away that it has a little bit of different vibe from many things you find in crypto voxels. It's very tranquil and harmonious and uh, almost space. Um, that's how we want people to feel uh, in uh, every time they come into the valley. But of course, we have a lot of what we can potentially do with our avatars. Or, you know, like we can speak about games, we can speak about books, we can speak about graphic novels, about many things. We do have a base for that already, but we are not going to put on the roadmap things that we are not 100%, uh, how to say it, like uh, that 100% activated. You know, we don't, we're never going to overpromise uh, thing, uh, things for the people who come and decide to invest into the project. But I think that's something that people can see clearly themselves if they make a deep dive into our team and into what is already done and activated, that the potential is there and a lot of work is happening on a backstage, a lot of writing, uh, the lore is amazing, the story is amazing, we can't wait to start releasing the story. I mean, the story is enough to make a whole <laughs> <That's what. laughs> to make a whole movie yeah, your audio cut out just a little bit there but that's i agree it's really uh cool what you got i actually just found the link on their twitter to the crypto voxel so i'm actually just uh hanging out in there right now showing the people you can drop in at crypto voxels and uh if you look at enchanted valley's twitter you can look at their link tree and uh find the crypto voxel link there very cool space you got built out here and people can have meetings and join up in the metaverse yeah so you got your lot already um are there plans um thinking about you know expanding outside of crypto voxels and obviously it would be depending on you know sales and and, and building the community and getting the revenue right um because i know those other metaverse spots can get pretty pricey um, but their graphics also get a little better and there's a lot of you know different opportunities have you guys thought about that at all or are you really focused well, on crypto of we're always researching all of the possible options uh this is like the the kick starting point you know like for us of course we're always looking into all of the possible options and uh metaverse um in general is a very important part on our roadmap, uh, understanding how important the metaverse uh, is going to be in the future. So we are always making our research for sure, but we are planning also first to expand and make more interesting stuff in that space that we already have. Uh, there is a reason why that place is uh, by the ocean on the water. Uh, yeah. Eventually, we're gonna have water creatures coming in, you know, like we have five drops and first drop are the land creatures that we are preparing for. And then they're gonna be uh, the fire creatures and eventually water creatures are coming in. So if somebody accidentally falls into the ocean there, you might like some Easter eggs and like uh, clue that more stuff is coming. And to start with, uh, like if somebody is up for like following us and checking our journey, um, next week we are going to be announcing where the first gallery um, is going to be opening uh, with showing the work of uh, all of our artists. And uh, like there is this little island that you can see with a fountain with our symbol in the center and also the first floor of the gallery. Uh, is where the exhibition is going to happen. Uh, we share this space with some very well-known uh, artist space as well. So you can see works uh, that you recognize very easily, like once you start going through the gallery. And yeah, that's, that's our first activation point. Of course, always looking in the future for everything that's possible for crypto, uh, for um, metaverse in general. And one of the things that we're gonna activate for the people that are our first collectors because what we are doing right now we are already minting and we're 75 percent minted out of our collector's pass uh, which we call an artifact so that thing you can that you center um the symbol this is an artifact which has a very important key role in a whole lore and a lore and a background story and artifact is um only there are only 500 of them ever released and all of the people who are holders of an artifact are going to 
where crypto voxels are wearable in a shape of, shape of the same mandala that you can wear as your like head or like <laughs> one nice, that's nice the one. badge maybe <laughs> Nice badge, or you can yeah. carry it in front of yourself. So there will be only 500 of those really for people who want to take part in our metaverse events. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Yeah, and I love the the symmetry and the and the real art behind that. It's really amazing. Um, wow, it's a lot to think about on that enchanted uh, enchanted valley for sure. And I definitely wish you guys all the best. And what is the date? Oh, March seventh, public mint, right? So that's when yeah, the, March. That's when the phase the public are going. Mint. And uh, on the March 6th, uh, March 5th, March 6th is when the artifact holders are going to be claim their NFT because artifact holders, uh, like, um, they mint an artifact at 0 0.055, which is 30% uh, uh, actual price is going to be. And they will be the first ones to claim because if you're an artifact holder, you're on our forever pre-mint list. You don't need to get on any like a premium spots. You don't need to register for anything. If you have an artifact, you already can come and claim one NFT for free with all of the other goodies that artifact holders are going to have. And then after artifact holders, there will be a premium list uh, mint. And then on uh, uh, the last day is uh, going to be a public mint. Nice. Yeah, that's that's really cool utility you've built into the the artifact, and I like it because it's kind of rewarding those early investors, right? Um, and definitely a cool kind of tactic for people to think about. So you you get this amazing collector's item. There's also an animated version being dropped to you. You're dropping crypto we voxels wearables, um, and like you said, the price is thirty percent cheaper than what the mint price on the uh, actual PFPs is going to be. So if you purchase one of these and you get a free PFP, then you just saved a bit of money on that too plus all the other cool utilities. So really uh, great work by your team there. Um, and I think it's a, it's a cool way to build out initially, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, I'm still debating whether I want to get the Faye or wait and see what else there is as far as the free one, but I, I definitely want to grab one of these Faye's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no. <laughs> they all are going to be so different. I promise they, they all are, are going to be so completely different. <laughs> no doubt. Um, and as far as timelines on the future next... Um, you know, races. I don't know if you're calling them races or what are you calling them? Different archetypes. We we call them orders. Orders, <laughs> right? The different orders. All right. So when when's the second order coming? Um, roughly. I know you don't have an exact date, but are you guys? Yeah. Looking at what are you looking at? So you we are looking to make all of the five drops in a course of two months. Uh, oh. I don't have exact dates, but let's say our goal is to make sure uh, that all of the five drops are going to be released in a course of two months, uh, starting from the first one. Oh, OK. So you got your hands full then there. <laughs> you guys yeah, they're going to be, gonna be a big vacation after. <laughs> <laughs> be going hard on those generative uh, reviews. Wow, very interesting. Well, thank you. I think that's been a very uh, educational kind of uh, a lot of good tips for anybody looking at possibly getting into generative NFTs and especially for the right reasons. I think, you know, building out those long term uh, projects and really seeing it as a way to build community, raise revenue, raise funds for a really cool creative project that everyone can benefit from because your initial investors who purchase your NFTs are going to be along for the ride. Ideally, you know, you can't really, you know, guarantee that people won't want to just flip and whatever but that's part of the economy as well you know <laughs> and the, the hope is that as some people sell other people are buying in and it just keeps growing from there right that's exactly that you know we look at that as a as a way of growing uh our brand not only as a nft collection or nft drop uh this is a long-term vision for uh, many years to come and we're just like releasing our roadmap step by step uh, every time when we are 100% secure that we are going to be able to execute it. But the vision is big and the dreams are even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I wish you the best with that. It's really exciting. Um, I had one question on looking at these um, generative pieces and your artwork. Definitely, you know, can see your style in it, especially in the shading and, and just the colors and artistry. Um, but how do you see this? project influencing your um you know your collections on OpenSea and your individual works 
Um, and are you kind of leaning more towards one of ones going forward? Or are you still going to do these kind of limited themed collections kind of like Eye Above Sky? So sorry, that was two questions there. But, uh, but how, yeah, how is this project influencing your art? And then what can we look forward to seeing um, on the art side from you on the collection side? Well, it definitely is going to influence my techniques, which is a completely normal process. You know, once you're doing something for a really long time, you keep developing new and new techniques. And I can say that I'm much better now drawing hair and metal. So I'm really looking forward to create a lot of complicated things with like shining metals and crystals and all of that. Uh, how exactly it's going to be? It's, uh, I don't know actually at the moment. Of course, like my main focus as an artist uh, would always be on one-on-one -on -one, uh, art. That was always my priority since the first days when I came into the space. Um, you know, marketing for one-on-one -on -one art is pretty difficult. Um, the market is not as huge as all of the rest of the nft world but that's where i want to be and that's what i really more at the moment i'm really into complicated epic sceneries and if with my early work you mostly see a character as a center figure of uh, whatever is happening in frame um in the future probably there will be much more epic stuff with like the full-on landscapes and like battlefields and all of that like just um, that as much as i can say and as soon as the collection is released and I can start working on my own stuff again in the same pace, I do that, but of course I don't have as much time because minting is soon and it's always pretty intense pre-releasing. Yeah, no no well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's cool that it is influencing you and uh, definitely look forward to seeing your other one of ones. And I know your, your stock is going up, so uh, it'll be cool to see how it influences uh all of your your collections and your other uh, right. artists too. i have a bag of unreleased well work already i'm looking for a good moment to start releasing that so nice. there are some surprises coming for sure cool, cool. well that's exciting that's exciting well i think we've uh, touched on some really awesome educational points um and uh really thank you for sharing your story i think it's inspiring um you know i think you're just at the beginning of your your amazing digital kind of renaissance and, and bringing all of these amazing pieces into the digital world and and your art from prior to that uh, into this space so it seems to be blending together really nicely um just last question maybe on uh, that i like to ask every creative and uh you know artist that i bring onto the podcast what do you say to um, other creatives, other artists who are looking at the NFT space and maybe hesitant or just, you know, believing the FUD and thinking that it's all a scam or whatever? Um, you know, what do you say to those creatives who uh, aren't taking advantage of this opportunity and uh, how would you convince them or, or try to, you know, what would you use to sell it to them? <laughs> uh, I don't normally convince anybody to, uh, I, uh... I just try to help as much as possible to those who come and ask how to do that. So then I dedicate all of my time to trying to help that people as much as possible and giving them all of the advice experience uh, so they don't step on the same underwater stones that I stepped into. But I don't really go around convincing people that much. So far, at least between among my friends, I wouldn't have a big pushback. Uh, never had to get into the, I, I know I'm lucky because I know that many people get a lot of hate on NFT as well, probably mm -hmm. like that's how my community in the real world is. Most of my friends get deeply interested, but many of them wouldn't jump on because they have uh, already very busy real life uh, jobs and they are not sure that they would have uh, time to dedicate to that basically, you know, like especially like tattoo artists, for yeah. example, could this come from those are people that are occupied from morning to the late evening and they have big commitments and it's tough for them but to those who are just coming into the space and want to figure out how to do that i always say just patience and consistency are the main, nice. the main tools yeah that's some good advice for sure and that's uh i, I like it you're not much in the in you're not on the evangelist side you're just on the, the helping to onboard side you know <laughs> and I, I, yeah. I feel that too yeah I, I i got a couple artist friends i'm still slowly trying to prod over here but you know you can't push people too much all you can say is hey when you want when you're ready you know i can show you how to onboard into this space and maybe we can uh, get some get some community building and some clients for you some uh, fans of your art you know so yeah it's exciting and that's a, it's a good point so 
kudos to you again for all of that onboarding work you're doing. Um, and thank you for sharing so much. Uh, did you have any closing thoughts or questions you'd like to share uh, before we wrap things up here on uh, episode six of Web3 Warriors? Oh, I just want to thank you. That was like a really, really nice talk. I had a lot of fun. Uh the video format is not as scary as I thought. It's like very fun and exciting. And I, I really enjoy it. Thank you so much for inviting. Me. Oh, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Violetta. And I'm glad it wasn't too scary. Um, hopefully we can have you back again in the future at some point. You know, we're just growing this Twitch streaming right now. So, you know, we're hoping to keep building our audience and community out. Um, and everybody who's watching us right now, thank you. Um, please do follow along. You can catch us every Saturday at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at Web3 Warriors on Twitch. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. And thank you again, Violetta. Um, and I'll catch you in the metaverse and everybody else out there. We'll see you in the metaverse. Till next time. Take care. Thank you. Uh